people to open this debate. Mr. Speaker, as ASEAN is moving toward becoming a single economic bloc, the implication of that is that they are becoming interconnected, not just in economically, but also culturally and politically. So we see that the implication of that is, now they cease to exist as a single individual country, but we see that now they exist as a whole collective group of country right now. So we think that when that is the case, right, we think that when one action will also have consequences on every country in ASEAN as well. So we think that when we talk about a responsibility to protect in this case, right, when there's an oppression, there is a threat to the well-being of people and every citizen of ASEAN, we think that it's the responsibility and obligation of all countries to help contribute to save the life of these people to make sure to stabilize the society as a whole for their own benefit of ASEAN itself. But before I move on to my substantive, let me define some key terms. When we talk about R2P, to put it simplistically, we're talking about when ASEAN country will come to help if one member country decide to oppress its people, decide to kill its people. The yardstick of oppressing people, right? We see that there is no clear cut situation, right? But we're going to tell you broadly that the one time that we are going to intervene, the one time that we are going to enact the responsibility responsibility to protect is when people are in danger and people are losing their life from the government. So, with, the, with that being said, right, let's move on to our mechanism. We have three levels of me mechanism in our team. The first step is that first we're going to explore the peaceful means first, right, such as dialogue, such as negotiation, right, because we don't want intervention in the first place. But if intervention is really necessary, we're going to use it as the last resort. So how are we going to intervene to save the people, right? Firstly, we're going to set up a military unit, but we think that, that military unit will be operating under the flag of ASEAN, which means that they will not answer directly to any individual country, but they will answer directly to the central body of ASEAN, which means that there will be no bias in this case. This means that this military unit will be controlled by the decision of every country. And the last step of mechanism is this. We think that before intervention, we need a consensus from every member country, except for the perpetrator country. So, before I move on to my substantive, yes, ma'am? According to your proposal, you are going against the non-intervention policy. You need to move to us while there is no alternative to the CSO, for example, you and Tony. Right, first, when Rohingya people, when Thai people are being oppressed, are being killed, you are waiting for NATO, which we think is too slow, right? When these people are being killed, we think the bastard actor is the member country themselves. We think that when we talk about NATO, when we talk about the United Nations, right? When they want to intervene in other country, there are two problems. First, they don't have the right to do so because they will violate the sovereignty of the ASEAN member country. And secondly, when they want to intervene, they will need to have an approval of the General Assembly, right? Which we think it will take a lot of time. We think that this matter is very time critical, right? Life are being lost, people are being killed, we need to act fast, we need to act immediately. So we think the sustainable way to do that is to make sure that the ASEAN country do this job by themselves. So we think that this will be a way that we can save the people to the fullest extent. But now, moving on to my substantive, which I have two substantive to present. The first one is why ASEAN can do this. And the second substantive will be talking about why ASEAN should do this. The first one, why ASEAN can do this. We said first, ASEAN members have already made an informed choice to become a single entity. So when we talk about informed choice, right, we see that before they sign that agreement, they, have, they must already be aware that every action that each individual country takes will have an impact on all ASEAN member countries as well. So we think that when that is the case, right, we think that all members then have the right to intervene and judge the action of a member country. 
important thing that I have told you, if one action can have consequences on all countries, right, then we think it's in the right, in, in the interest, and it's in the benefit of this, this country to make sure that they intervene, to make sure that they protect, and uphold the best interest of us, us and as a whole. So we think that any damage will threaten the existence of us and as a whole. And we see that the, um, the reason for doing this is becoming more and more apparent. Why? Because we think that right now, ASEAN is becoming more and more integrated, more interconnected every day. Right now, we have a single economic, uh, we have a single e market, market, a single economic market, a single workforce, and something like that. So we are now they are becoming interconnected, and so we see the need that they have to uphold the stability. And then moving on to my second substantive, talking about why ASEAN should do this, have two levels of nice. On the first one, are we talking about a moral obligation, right? Which in this case is the right to life. Because we say the right to life is the foundation right of humanity, and that is the right that does not end at national boundary, right? The right to life is universal, the right to life is global, and we think it is extend beyond national boundary. But I have already told you from the here, here, they're going to claim that, well, NATO can intervene, but I've already addressed that. So, we think that Austin, as a ASEAN, right, as a whole, being that they have the moral obligation, if one citizen of an individual country are being oppressed, being that it's in their moral obligation for other member country to help save these people life as well. So we think that when we talk about that moral, moral obligation, right, we think it's very apparent. Because we see that when you see someone suffer, then we think that you have an obligation to help them out. So we think it's already under the interest of the ASEAN member country to save these people life in the first place. But now when we move on to the second level of Nazi, talking about the collective interest of ASEAN. We think that in the eyes of the outside world, ASEAN is built as a single entity. We see that just like the European Union, right? When the Eurozone collapse, they don't see Greece collapse, they see the whole Eurozone collapse. We think that this logic is applied to ASEAN as well. So we think that when one problem happened to a single ASEAN country, we think that it affects the credibility, it affects the stability of the whole country. So when that is the case, when people are being oppressed in a particular ASEAN country, this is the harm. We see that the outside world will question ASEAN stability. And what's the harm of that? When they question your stability, you lose the credibility. So we think that when you lose the credibility, if we do not do something, it will damage ASEAN image permanently. So we think that when we use the ASEAN member to intervene, it will help improve that credibility. Why? Because we think that it will put check and balances against the state leader once they, be once they begin oppressing its own people. So we think that it will also in the interest of ASEAN to use ASEAN country themselves to intervene. Why? Because we think that first, it will not affect the relationship among the country, right? Because I've already stated in my model that you will have the consensus of other member country as well. So we think that it will not affect the relationship. And we think that ASEAN country understand the nature of the problem in ASEAN country more than the country in the US, in the Western world. So we think that ASEAN is a perfect actor. And we think that to maintain the existence of ASEAN, the R2P is to be enacted. Thank you. The speaker spoke for 7 minutes and 19 seconds. We thank the Prime Minister for his speech. We now call on the leader of the opposition to open the case of the opposition.
idea how ASEAN is a one collective unit of people staying together, which inherently means that each country has a primary interest in other people. In the same way that Thailand has a primary interest in gaining land from Cambodia. These kind of interests mean that each country is biased towards many decisions that come into play, or many decisions that come into play during intervention. So yeah, this kind of bias needs to be considered as the right to right to protect and the right to intervene. But I try to propose that there are other alternatives to do so without having ASEAN intervene as their own. Here is our counter model. What are we going to do? One, we're not going to let R2P become, R2P intervention become the norm in ASEAN community. Secondly, we think that the UN is the right, the best actor in this kind of scenario to intervene into things. Because we think that the UN always intervenes in terms of humanitarian humanitarian crisis. We also think that UN has organizations like the ICC, like the ICJ, and all the peace troops who allowed, has the capability to intervene and make a change in this kind of nation, make a change in this kind of ASEAN nation. I will prove to you later in my argument why the UN is the best actor to take action. But before I move on to rebuttals today. What is rebuttal on this model is that it needs every consensus from everybody inside of the name of ASEAN to be able to intervene. One, that because you have a consensus, you have to wait for nine countries or ten countries to come together and make the kind of decisions. Which means that these kind of decisions will be like less likely to take any action at all. Because these nine countries have to go back to their own nations and consider things and things over and over again. And at the same time, they are signs of letting people die while they are waiting for these nine people to come to their decisions. Compared to when you talk about the ideas that the UN later serve, when you talk about the idea of the UN, where it allows it to take action immediately, or easier for that process to guarantee the humanitarian uh, interventions is out there, humanitarian interventions is ready for these people. But secondly, you talk about even if those kind of ideas work, we are still violating the right or the idea of non-intervention policies, but they are safe. Yes, given no dire need of a benefit that's coming from why he's willing to make this kind of sacrifice when there are alternatives like the UN and my side has already appeared. But apart from that, there's no proof of feasibility of how these new troops coming from the ASEAN uh, is going to help people, of how these things are actually going to be better than other alternatives in the status quo. Second rebuttal on the idea of his moral obligation and collective, in, uh, collective interest. Why? Because, because these nations have nine countries have to intervene, they're probably, if they have no interest in the other countries, because they have to risk the lives of their own soldiers, these people are not going to send troops inside the country to intervene, which means you're not going to be able to intervene at all. But as secondly, you talk about the idea of moral obligation. We already say we already have the UN there to intervene to where people are killed. We think that moral obligation does exist, but it need to, but it is not, but should not be stick to an ASEAN nation that is biased. Um. Not even if no later, sir, we are having the idea of collective responsibility. You mean you have to, when you have to intervene, you are taking sides inside of us. When you come with up in a motion, have two countries that don't understand, agree, and eight countries that do agree, you create a, a divide inside of ASEAN and just do all the collective responsibility or collective no. agreement of ASEAN. Also, when you talk about the idea of credibility of ASEAN, when you, ASEAN as a nation will not be able to develop or not able to function because it is divided, those kind of credibility disappear within itself. Yes, sir. All right, then. When Rohingya people were being killed last year, where was the UN? So when you talk about this kind of idea of where the UN is or where the ASEAN is, let's see where I can make the comparative analysis. So the ASEAN is more likely to do something very biased. Something because they have a primary interest, they were intervening into something because they have an interest and have is to gain benefit from that. Compared to the idea of the UN, where they have the neutral third right. party and need to understand those things. So, Four points of understanding matter today. One, I'm going to talk about why this non-intervention policy in ASEAN is very, is very important. Secondly, why the UN is the best actor in today's debate. First argument, talk about the idea of ASEAN non-intervention policy. Need the idea that Thailand cannot invade into Burma or not invade into Cambodia exists for a reason, a reason the government has been trying to ignore. While the script when you need to keep ASEAN as community, the people are more comfortable to diplomatic ties with each other, knowing that this country is not going to attack me for their policy. But secondly, we think that there's a harm to intervening or destroying this kind of principle. But secondly, Man. there's no necessity because the other alternatives are working. They'll be ignoring the idea that status quo exists, that UN does intervene into countries. These alternatives are better and should be considered not having to go into uh, these kind of countries. But also, thirdly, we that ASEAN is, we don't think that ASEAN is a very slow process of consensus in their model. Actually, who's going to intervene? Where are you going to intervene? going to take five ages, or like five ages, or nine countries to come
come together. We did not pass the for humanity intervention and you talk as you talk about. But also the idea of slippery slope is this, uh, that the idea of the slippery slope, you know, one, nobody will be able to trade with that country anymore, or countries will take sides will not be able to trade anymore. Your diplomatic relationship as an ASEAN community are completely destroyed, coming from these RGP being able to put in place. But secondly, ASEAN becomes unstable as a community. So the AEC, then the AEC cannot, be fun cannot function anymore, and as I slowly deteriorates, destroy the collective responsibility the PM has been trying to give us. Second argument of the idea of whether the UN is the best actor in today's debate to actually do go, go, this kind of intervention. Firstly, we need to identify the UN as someone as an accept universally accepted organization, someone who's accepted by people around the world that has been cruel, someone who's an established Man. organization later, so established organization and established truth. Uh, an established organization. What does it mean? One, this UN who works with Thai people, work with Cambodian people, who has people specifically do, there to work with Asian people, a more understanding in the process, the guarantee that the intervention is going to be fair, that these kind of processes that go through things like UNFC or IBC or RTJ is something going to be fair. To me, that's more likely to a better the situation compared to Thailand, who probably just hate Cambodia for being Cambodia, is going to intervene to Cambodia for that specific reason. Uh -huh. Second level, second idea, the UN is a neutral third party who has no benefit going to the negotiation. It's probably coming from the outside, so they're looking at the big picture to so more, more efficient. So for example, Thailand wants land in Cambodia. It's more likely to be biased and go to invade into Cambodia just because they want those kind of land. This is a, that bias information is a violation of rights of those countries. It is unjustifiable in the RGP or to getting rights of these people. But apart from the third thing, we think that these are these UN are more likely to be more accomplished in actually sending troops and actually making a change in those kind of countries. So you send an efficient Asian troop out there, no, not knowing what they're capable of doing, but sending people to die. But you have countries like UN, which have these great troopers, or things like NATO, who are able to allow to come in, allow to come in and make an actual change. For example, like East Timor, where the UN is actually make tangible change. We say that these kind of alternatives exist. We don't want bias Asian nations making decisions that will store the connectivity responsibility of ASEAN. We want this kind of ASEAN to ex exist as a community. We stay with the opposite side. Thank you. The speaker spoke for 7 minutes and 34 seconds. We thank the leader of the opposition for her speech. We now call on the deputy prime minister to continue the case of the government. Ladies and gentlemen, the magical argument of UN intervention usually works almost in every debate so far, right? But sadly not in this one, and I'm going to tell you why. Firstly, the idea of UN being the best actor. We already analyzed to you that firstly, they are not able to react up to the speed of the problem, right? The problem happens every single day. We already told you of the whole bureaucratic you know, uh, uh, procedures that UN has to go through. We are saying that they are too slow, right? We think that they have to overcome exactly what you just mentioned, the non-intervention principle. What we argue in today's debate is that because we, the ASEAN, are right now uh, informing and we are saying that we deserve to be uh, serving each other, we deserve to protect each other, we think that choice is informed, we think once you are a member of ASEAN, you are already giving in to that very idea and to that very principle. You already accept that once something happens in my country and when every member uh, deems the uh, uh, appropriate that it's time to intervene, I say, yes, it is acceptable, right? We think that is easier for us, it's faster for us. Now, we, let, let's just look at the second uh, level of this analysis, is the effectiveness of whether or not our intervention is going to be effective in the, uh, uh, at the end of the day, right? We argue that at 
least the ASEAN members understand the culture, the political platform that is going on because we have a similar economy, we have a similar political platform, ladies and gentlemen. The power struggle and things like that, we say we are a better judge as a collective, uh, as a coll uh, collective community. When they talk about bias, we first talk about, okay, then that same bias problem can also be applicable towards idea of UN and NATO, right? Who are you to say that at the end of the day, UN is going to prioritize ASEAN and shift all the troops to ASEAN rather than focusing on Middle East? We think that level of bias is also there, something that they completely ignore. They're very disappointed, right? But we say, at the end of the day, even if biasness is there in ASEAN, we say it would probably probably be a positive bias. Why? Here's why. Because at the end of the day, ASEAN as a, as a community, they will do whatever it takes that benefits everyone, right? We say at the end of the day, if they're biased, then it's you know, probably the kind of bias that would uh, produce a positive implication or a positive impact that would benefit every member of the society. We think that's something that we can go for in today's debate. We, we argue that if they accept the idea of universal moral obligation and they think UN should do it, we don't know why that very universal moral application cannot be extended towards ASEAN as well when we are even much closer towards the problem, uh, the, the, the country that we are talking about, right? Secondly, ladies and gentlemen, second rebuttal is the idea of fear and you know, at the end of the day, everything will be broken down and all the effort will be lost, right? We said, look, we are not saying that we're going to apply guerrilla warfare with surprise attack that you know individual countries are going to send troops, mobilize troops and march them left and right to different countries. We already told you in our first speaker there will be procedure, there will be protocol. Everything is planned and discussed. Everything is being decided through a procedure. We already told you it's not going to be surprised. We told you that we'll try diplomatic effort. We're going to negotiate and we are going to talk. Something that their argument doesn't really make sense in today's debate, right? The Cambodia example it just you know just out of the world ladies and gentlemen how exactly let, let's, let's take a scenario right if Cambodians start killing each other how exactly would ASEAN troops marching in you know saving these people we start in Thailand getting a piece of land we just don't see how that is going to happen from saving people to getting land doesn't make any sense ladies and gentlemen now in today's event I will walk you through to two more very important ideas first is on the idea of how our policy deters problems from happening in the first place and secondly how the, how, uh, the economic implication of how it damages the efforts toward a, success, a successful AEC in the future but before I go on is there any uh, clarification needed Drawing a random proof from nowhere would actually be effective at the end of the day. Comparing to UN, having having that kind of success in the UN. I I can't describe this right. Drawing a random proof from nowhere won't be as effective as UN. But you know, constructing a formal and a uh, you know a, a body of of army based upon a very agreement and contract that was probably a draft upon and something that everyone agrees upon is most probably going to be faster and more efficient as you know my first speaker and then my rebuttal. Now firstly how it deters the problem from happening, right? Under the status quo, the government can become extremely violent very easily because they're in full control and because the opposition is weak and German. The equation is quite simple in this kind of situation, right? What we do in today's debate is we add in a new agent, we add in a new actor. Now those countries or you know, uh, uh, leaders that are trying to commit uh, uh, humanity crime will now think twice before they start doing anything, right? Because the cost and benefits analysis now has just changed. The equation has changed. They need to redo the calculation. Now the benefits of suppressing those people towards those uh, uh, those particular leaders, you know, uh, might, be, might be offset by the cost of having to deal with the whole idea of ASEAN intervention. We think this is something that is worth looking into. But secondly, we also argue that the, uh, the idea of economic implication towards a successful AEC is very, very important because at the end of the day, that's exactly why we have ASEAN community in the first place, right? We say that AEC, the idea of AEC is an economy where everything is interconnected, where, you know, everything is one nation, right? We look at example uh, like Eurozone, where Greece is not treated as Greece, but as uh, a Eurozone so on as a whole. Firstly, we argue that they fail to analyze or they fail to understand the characteristic of ASEAN nation. ASEAN nation 
is an export-oriented block, meaning that we are more powerful when we are together, we are more powerful when we deal with other foreigners' trade, right? We think that instability, when it happens, it will deter the powerful people to produce more efficiently. It's harder for ASEAN as a whole to commit to the production or the, uh, or the business commitment that we have done, right? We think the flow is disrupted. It's harder now for people to be traveling back and forth. It disrupts also the labor force and it disrupts the whole idea of the standard of living of people within ASEAN itself, right? Because you have to understand, AEC is not about people in Myanmar and people in Thailand or in Cambodia, uh, you know, trading to telephone, things like that. What happened is that there will be a free flow of people. People travel around the German, people will get hurt, the economy will get hurt, the business will get hurt at the end of the day. So, so what exactly are we trying to propose in today's event? We look at both the peaceful solution, something that will be very effective, and we also look at how exactly can we do it so that it does not hurt the very original goal of AEC, right? We, we value both sides and we argue that at the end of the day, whatever they are proposing is not really mutually exclusive. If UN and NATO is really efficient and is much more efficient, then most likely they'll get there before you know uh, the ASEAN unit can mobilize. Then that's good for them, right? But we say, what if we are faster? In this case, we argue that we are faster. Then we say, in that case, we should win this event. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. The speaker spoke for 7 minutes and 23 seconds. We thank the Deputy Prime Minister for his speech. We now call on the Deputy Leader of Opposition to continue. Continue the case of the Opposition. Also, 
will also have an incentive to invest, in, to intervene in the ASEAN. They're not different situations. But before we move on to my arguments, yes. Okay. If the UN is really neutral in that case, why is Palestinian issue is still biased towards the US and the See that the UN, right? If we were to have the ICC, the ICC will have a neutral standpoint because they will be able to evaluate both sides of the point, right? When the ICC were to intervene under that kind of paradigm in Southeast Asian nations, the ICC will give an indictment that is more neutral than if the UN were to actually come in or the ASEAN were to come in. The ICC was what our model that my first speaker said. So moving to my two arguments in this debate, on the first, on the long-term sustainability of this paradigm, and second of all, the feasibility of ASEAN and UN intervention. Proceeding to the first argument on long-term sustainability, on the first level of unification of Vietnam, right? These nations came together with the premise of being unified. But when we see the fundamental premise of intervention is polarization, right? We're not talking about unification when one country is intervening with another. The simple principle is, if we're intervening with you, it means that we're disagreeing with what you're doing, which is against the whole idea of being unified, which is, I don't understand why they keep on saying we need to be unified, we need to fight so we can fight with each other. I really don't understand that point. Um, on the second level of the idea of propaganda, right? What will happen is it's deleterious to the fundamental principle of an economic community, right? For instance, if Thailand were to invest, were to uh, intervene into Cambodia, right? Cambodia will see Thailand as not as a friend and ally, but as an enemy. The conflict of this is that they will propagandize, I'm not sure if that's a word, but they will propagandize the Thailand as an enemy and not as an ally. This will essentially create citizens and other uh, companies, etc., etc., in the particular nation to no longer have an incentive to trade with the host country, with the intervening country. What I'm trying to say is that the local nation that's being intervened in will no longer have the incentive to be allies with the country that is intervening. Sir. Finally, on the third level, we said that if this were to happen, the conclusion is that the AEC will collapse, the fundamental uh, feasibility of the AEC will collapse, and if this collapses, it sets a platform and presence for other parts of the ASEAN, such as the APSC and the ASCC to also collapse, which are fundamental to the functioning of the, uh, the ASEAN. But before we move on to my second argument, yes. That is exactly the problem you're not getting it. Thailand is not intervening Cambodia, ASEAN is intervening Cambodia. How is that wrong? Sure, okay, once again, Thailand is part of the ASEAN, and your model was all about like Thailand has to agree with it, right? All nine countries have to agree with it. So, yeah. isn't Thailand have to agree with it in order for the ASEAN to intervene? So that just explains that point, right? Uh, <laughs> Proceeding to the second argument on the feasibility of ASEAN and UN intervention. On the first level, we see that the principle of a norm, right? This debate is about a norm. When it becomes a norm, we see that the last resort of intervention becomes the first resort, and thus we need the UN to intervene, as it can consider other options such as negotiations more appropriately than the ASEAN. On the second level, we see that there are hidden agendas of other nations that we cannot completely discount these kind of ideas, right? For instance, it prevents Thailand from invest from serving expeditiously if they were to, even if you were to say that they agree with this consensus. Even if all nine countries agree that the perpetrator is wrong, right? We see that they will not provide a sufficient army, a sufficient troop, in order to combat the problem at the end of the day. Because they have their own hidden agenda, because they only have, they have their own complications with that particular nation. So even if you were to concede that they will cons they will have a consensus with it, the, the army that they send is not going to be enough. What is the conflict? What is the consequence of this? Number one, the humanitarian problem that we're trying to solve at the end of the day doesn't get solved. And number two, it actually gets aggravated more because then the country that is being intervened sees everyone else as perpetrators and thus are less likely to do stuff like trading with them in the future and they do not see them as allies anymore. On the final level, on the funding and army, right? We see that the ASEAN has less funding than the UN and less resources to conduct this mission and combat the perpetrators at the end of the day. The concern with this is that conflicts at the end of the day are not solved and more lives are lost, which is, a, I'm sure, the clash point in this debate, who is trying to solve, more, who is trying to save more lives. I'd like to end this debate by analyzing how NATO is far more powerful than the ASEAN in terms of troops, because if the ICC were to form an indictment, then NATO would the NATO, according to our model, will send troops in, and the NATO is far more capable in conducting missions and getting the job done in terms of serving and saving their lives. In contrast to the ASEAN, which we highly doubt will actually intervene in the situation, but even if they do, they will not solve the conflict at the end of the day. Thank you very much. The speaker spoke for 7 minutes and 11 seconds. We thank the Deputy Leader of the Opposition for her, his speech we now call on the government. Hello. To to uh for the case of the government.
here's the thing, right? We believe that lives are important. We believe that if there's more help, it's probably something that's much better, right? And basically, in our side of the house, it's a clear clash between an ASEAN army or a UN army within today's debate, or however, even from our comparative analysis, can ASEAN army get there before a UN army did? And if they do so, can it save more lives at the end of the day? That'll be further proof in my flashpoint. And moreover, right, we already proved to you certain points of how ASEANs are actually caring for each other when you talk about in terms of stability, in terms of unity. And moreover, there's more of to lose at stake when you compare it to UN. Here's the case, right? That's why we further prove to you, well, we further prove to you in my clash points how this is actually a much better, efficient way to solve the problem. First of all, right, intervention repertoires before I move to my clash. First idea is the idea, well, here's the thing, right? If you intervention in those countries, it will create, you know, backlash to unity and more problem at the end of the day, right? First of all, right, we believe that here's the thing. If a, uni if a country can be unified, all countries have to agree that this intervention has to begin in the first place. We believe that it is a consensus from well, the, rest of the, whole unit, the rest of the whole unity. We believe that, that probably, first of all, something wrong. And second of all, probably a decision made by the whole unified group of body. Where you have to fit into those groups of body, you have to change something as well. But second of all, right, I said, well, here's the thing, Cambodia might hate Thailand. Well, here's the thing, right? We intervene as ASEAN, but Thailand is just part of it, right? If you're saying under that logic, then they're probably going to hate UN as well, because Thailand is also part of UN. We see that those kind of logic doesn't stand, doesn't stand with their whole grudges against those people. But thirdly, right, we believe that, well, if these, you say that, well, AEC might fall, ASEAN might not be unified, right? Here's the problem, right? If they still undermine those people rights, if there's probably potential harms towards the whole unity as a whole, and we believe that if you're forming up and trying to push further, and at the end of the day, going to an end goal, where you be in a situation where even if you're under the same unity, but there's still oppressions going on in several ideas and several areas, where stability is actually not being achieved in today's society, we see that there's, there's something needs to be tackled. And for the AEC to move forward as a much, for ASEAN to move forward as a much stronger route, this kind of issue has to be tackled first handedly. And this policy would actually provide check and balance for those oppressive regimes, for those oppressive junta, maybe, to think twice before they actually act to intervene in this case. Right? Because particularly, right, the moment you have some consequences for this junta, they have to think twice before to start oppressing their people to begin with. Right? These deterrence, positive deterrence effects already mentioned by my previous speaker. Before I move on to my clashes, any points? What do you do if one country, Here's the thing, right? Then they basically have some things to do about that. And you have to have more dialogues in terms of like, why are you not signing it to this kind of idea? What problems still stay, exist, right? We believe that it's something about consensus. It's something that they have to argue about, right? But when it comes to people dying, right? Hundred thousand, in terms of like hundreds and thousands of people dying, we believe that countries who are at stake will be more or less likely clearer and try to understand the situation. And if they see there's something wrong with the unity, then therefore more dialogue can be encouraged in those kind of ideas. We see it's better. And moreover, right, when they talk about, well, how can this army be formed in the beginning? We say, well, here's the thing, right, we can accept from all nations, we don't mind. But here's the thing, right, the moment that you've enforced it at the terms of unity for ASEAN, this kind of thing is possible for the sake of stability at the end of the day, right? We believe that those kind of things is much better. And moreover, right, even if it's less efficient, at least it's working for the sake of ASEAN. So moving on to my clash. There's one clash is all other rebuttals will be incorporated. One clash is one clear one in the end. And which is better, basically, ASEAN or UN? As a whole, in terms of society impact as well, but as an individual actor as well. Right? First of all, idea of neutrality, like, which is I like a lot. Right? When they talk about, here's the thing, um, UN is being neutral. But first of all, right, we believe it's dominated, first of all, by Western countries. And second of all, they're using their own measurements to measure what is actually the problem in today's society, not particularly using ASEAN measurement or using countries who actually understand more at the neighboring countries, right? But what moreover is we see cases where UN are not actually maybe neutral in this case, for example, Palestinian issues, for example, Syrian issues, where it's actually a fight from big countries even, right? If they are really neutral and they really see people's lives as someone vulnerable, why don't they exceed? But don't they step in to solve those kind of issues? Why do they let them stand in today's debate? Right? And moreover, right, when I talk about the idea of ICC, right? Here's the thing, right? IEC is always an ongoing case, it's so it's even longer than ASEAN, we believe that that's already out of the debate. And moreover, right, when I talk about peacekeeping force, here's the thing, right? Who is supporting it in the first place? It's not particularly other countries who are contributing towards this peacekeeping force. And if there is no particularly any stakes, why would they have to contribute to the peacekeeping force in the first place? And second of all, if it's already working, but well, particularly Bohemian, where many of them are actually being massacred at the end of the day, why are they not coming to help those people? We see that because ASEAN might not have as much stakes for UN to actually intervene, we see that's why it's better, and we see that's why maybe it's not actually a neutral actor. 
Second of all, right, the idea of speed, right? Comparatively, well, here's the thing, right? At least in our ASEAN countries, these countries are in the same geopolitical areas. We see that there's probably more at stake when you compare it to UN, who has to care for all over the world, and where ASEAN has only to care for its own blocks. We see that particularly on the comparative analysis of speed, we say that maybe with higher stakes, with more something to lose, at least it would enforce or encourage these people to act at a much faster rate. But thirdly, right, the important part, the idea of bias. Well, here's the thing, right? They say we can invade on a personal interest. But first of all, right, we already told you that the criteria is that people have to be at stake, people's lives have to be lost. But second of all, right, we see that other countries also have to agree. If Thailand wants to invade and other country doesn't see the reason to invade, then we don't probably not going to see any intervention at the end of the day, right? But other countries also have something to lose, and if there is actually a problem, they'll probably go for it. But third of all, right, we believe that moral obligations do actually exist, even in the case of Khmer Rouge, what happens like several decades ago. We see that what happens is that neighboring countries open up to accept refugees, but what UN does is not going here anywhere. We see that that is some problem that they have to engage with and that's how the houses well when they want to believe in UN. But thirdly, well, fourthly, right, when you talk about the idea of forming up armies, when you compare it to the capability to UN, right? Okay, fine. We, we, okay, fine. We believe that ASEAN, first of all, might not be as strong as UN, but even if that is the case, right, we believe that when there's some states at hand, and these people only work for ASEAN and doesn't go to Syria to help solve those problems, we believe that the diversification of the force would probably be better under outside of the house, right? Because what UN has to do is that they only not only have to deal with Middle East, they might have to deal with Western Europe, and they might have to deal with Africa as well. We see that they have to diversify that force, but comparatively to an army, to a thing that is set up for its own region, we say that is much better options for the people on the ground. But lastly, right, the idea of this providing as an option, right? We say, well, non intervention really might exist. So we said we would want to rely on it just for the sake of us and to be a much better unit, a much better uniform law when comparatively to other types of law which exist out there. Right? We believe that it doesn't just relate it only to economy, but also related to stability politically within the region as well. And we believe that when they're providing it as an option, we're okay with UN coming to help, fine. But the thing is, if we can help it faster, and if this is for the sake of the people of ASEAN, we're proud to propose. The speaker spoke for 7 minutes and 19 seconds. We thank the government for his speech. We now call on the opposition brief to further the case of the opposition. from the idea of world outside population. We don't think that ASEAN community with just a with random group will be able to actually combat with those die with those pressing cases like they have for case. First of all, let's take a look at two main clashes in today's debate. First principal chaos and second about practical issues. So let's take a look at the principal issue in, in today's debate. What the idea of principal justification? Let's take a step back and look at both sides of also. Government proposed an ASEAN standing army, opposition opposed a United Nations army. And we think it is not mutually exclusive, it, 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 it is mutually exclusive, it's not what Carrie said. Well, first of all, we think and at, it, at, at the first place we are not going we are not going to violate the, the core principle of ASEAN, which is a non-intervention policy at the first place, and consensus, so, uh, which is two main core principles that we need to uphold. But moreover we argue uh, but moreover but moreover we argue that at the end of the day, if we have, if under your program you have an ASEAN standing, I mean, UN wouldn't actually at the end of the Sorry. day intervene into those countries. No, thank you, sir. Because they already see that these countries already have a standing army. At the end of the day, UN wouldn't care uh, about ASEAN, and we think that's exceptionally, that is detrimental to ASEAN and to you later on. So let's take a look, what are the principal justification that they need to prove to us? They need to prove to us that there is no alternative, and also there is, they need to prove us that there is a certainty of benefits, but they have failed to do so. Why do we say so? We have provided a myriad of examples, for example, ICC, ICJ, NATO, UN. We think that it, it is like they, we have cracked the cause of successful, successful um, intervention and successful cases. Like for, I, uh, for ICC, like Khmer Rouge, like what Robert has said, UN, for example, like East Timor, we, have, we already have like 
my rate of example that have proven to us, but we haven't heard any sufficient response from Zion version to prove that this alternative doesn't exist. But they all, the only thing they say is that it is, it is slow. But I will prove to you later why this, how, uh, this, this two will be faster. Moving on to the second principle justification about the idea of uh, the certainty of benefit. They haven't proved to us that there is a certainty of and uh, the certainty of benefit. Actually, Gary considered the fact that there is no certainty at all. He said that it, like, if I asked him a point of information, drawing random proof, at the end of the day, how can you make sure that it will be effective? He said, yes, we cannot make sure that it is effective, but it, at the end of the day, it is better. We think it's one liner argument from side permission that it is effective, and at the end of the day, I will tell you later more why it is not. So let's take a look what I have proposed to you. We propose to you a United Nation. They tell us that we are violating sovereignty, but act, but actually under your paradigm, you are also violating the sovereignty of the country as well. But both of you are like, what do you have said? Moral obligation also also justify intervention or uh, violating sovereignty. But more we argue on the point of the idea of neutrality. Sir. We think you, so thank you, sir. We think that UN are more neutral. So let me address the, the point of information that um, Robert had asked my, uh, my speaker. He, uh, he asked about the idea of Palestinian. The thing is, the reason that UN are not neutral because UN uh, because US are in, involving in the conflict. Similarly, in this case, ASEAN is involving the conflict. At the end of the day, this means that ASEAN will be biased like US, and at the end of the day, the conflict will not be solved. That's the point that they need to come up and rebut in their speech. So I have already proven to you that our model, which a better model, is justified, and also under your paradigm, you are not going to make anything better. Before we move on, any part of it. Sir, in the worst case scenario on our side, even if the ASEAN army is not that effective, why don't you let the army, the ASEAN army, take control of this situation first and even if we are bad and we wait for the UN? Because you paint the picture that the problem is so dire, you need an immediate solution and then you say you will wait. We don't think under your plan. First of all, we don't, we don't want to waste time like testing like random tools because we already have a specialized tool from the United Nations and that perfectly leads me to my second point of contention about the idea of practical issue. Let's say look at the first part about the short term. The we talk about the idea of feasibility, the first part about feasibility, they, they, uh, which side would be faster? We think that UN would be faster because first of all we have seen record, for example, Mali, uh, intervention in Mali, intervention in Central Republic of Africa. But under your paradigm, you don't have any particular record, but more we are, we, uh, we, rebut, we rebut on the point of uh, ASEAN consensus. Because when you are finding consensus from nine countries, it always takes time. But, uh, but there, there is also a possibility of these countries voting no. Because, for example, if like conflict happened in Malaysia and Laos, and Laos need to pay money, need to send troops in, why would they send troops in that first place? We think there is a tendency for these countries to say no, to protect their private interests, and at the end of the day, if the consensus says no, uh, they cannot, uh, their model is already invisible. Invisible. But what robot has told you? He, what robot was the? But the response from cyber population is that, oh, so okay, we will we'll, um, host more dialogue. But the problem is, but the, the problem here is that under your paradigm, you are saying that the problem is so that you need an immediate action, and then you say you want more dialogue. I don't think that's uh, a great thing to do in this debate. But moreover, let's take a look at the second part of the idea of efficacy. We think that UN have more money. UN have a specialized tool. These people have experience, like they have been in peacekeeping mission for like hundreds of missions. But under your paradigm, you are drawing random tools. But more we don't think that ASEAN have enough money like UN, UN, and more of like, uh, yeah, because they don't have enough money, they don't have like, for example, protective, uh, protective weapon, web, they don't have weapons or protective church or something like that to fulfill the mission. And that's very important for these kind of mission. But more of it, they, when they talk about the idea of when UN need to cope uh, with the situation in the Middle East or uh, situation in Africa. But let me tell you, UN is like 10 or 20 times bigger than ASEAN. We think that UN is already capable of taking care of the of, like all the world and is more capable, especially when they are uh, when they are all experienced. Next point, when they talk about the idea of culture. We don't think that the idea of culture is mutually exclusive because we think that under the CS right now, UN can understand ASEAN culture. We have representatives from ASEAN nations. Moreover, we have experts in UN to like um, explore about the culture in ASEAN, explore the culture in every country, which we have seen several researches in the CS right now. We don't think culture is a problem. So next point, what the idea of bias? Uh, bias. Under your paradigm, 
that RCN might be biased because of their private interest. But when we have a third, a neutral third party who doesn't have any private interest, at the end of the day, it would be better. But when they talk about the idea of economic harms, first of all, we think that even if we were to consider that there might be some immediate uh, economic harm from their side, but then they left and they fail to respond to a key part of uh, acute argument about the idea of ASEAN breaking up because you are neglecting these countries, you are breaking the core principle of ASEAN, and at the end of the day, we think under your power is going to be even worse and for more recent reasons. I have to put to you that under their power, it is not justified for you to, uh, to it is not justified for you to use a controversial model to actually violating the core principle of ASEAN and also I have to put to you that it is practically fraud. I'm sorry. And for all these reasons, I'm proud to oppose. Thank you. <laughs> the speaker spoke for 7 minutes and 35 seconds. We thank the opposition for his speech. We now call on the opposition reply speaker to close the case of the opposition. Oh, 
part of it about going between countries. It's only going to happen when I was tall and yo-yo, which is never going to happen anyway. But also like the idea of economic problems. Say that people will need to export with each other. What is that? We think that these countries will be allowed to do economic games without other countries in other. They will still be going on with this kind of economic export. It's not a problematic to them. Second issue with the idea of credibility. Yo Yo has come here and told us you need that ASEAN needs to be credible, that also that we want ASEAN to remain as a nation. One, they have never touched on the point of how making this decision would divide ASEAN into two separate sides, but people would want to intervene and people would know how to intervene, which means things that the AEC, things that the ASEAN community as a whole will collapse. So people will not touch each, other, touch each other anymore because they have an intervention policy that allows you to attack other people. But apart from that, the people will not be willing to trade with each other because of these kind of political means coming in the block in front of them. So they lose the credibility of the ASEAN and ASEAN being able to function. This is the kind of harm that the government sides need to recognize. They do need and are an alternative like the new way to come in and take action. An alternative more effective and efficiently in doing so. You know, the ASEAN is a country has a stake in this kind of country and will always make a biased decision decision. We say that Snoopy goes back home to so take decision back to Gotham. Thank you. The speaker spoke for four minutes and fourteen seconds. We thank the opposition opposition reply speaker for her speech. We now call on the government reply speaker to close the debate. Ladies and gentlemen, in my reply speech, I want to walk you guys through to four very important points. Firstly, in terms of the capability, right? We talk a lot about incentive. We talk about how there's a direct incentive for ASEAN members to act strategically and that we can act faster because we, are, we have the strategic location. Ladies and gentlemen, it's easier for us to mobilize rather than uh, comparing to you, uh, uh, UN or NATO, right? It's even funnier when they start throwing in new actors like ICC when they don't even realize that ICC usually take years if not decades you know to pass a particular judgment right it's gonna take 10 or 20 years before they say oh you and go for it let's go in and help people unfortunately they will all be dead but right? if anything we argue with that example like when the storm hits Myanmar it, it's not the Red Cross and the UN that gets there first that are able to get in we say it's the ASEAN members that are able to get there first because of why because we we understand the tra uh, tradition, we understand the culture, we understand the political arena better than the UN and the Red Cross in German. Moving to the second point on the idea of non-intervention policy, right? Now, this is really, really tiring. It's a circular logic coming from that side of the house. It's illegal because you can't do it, and you can't do it because it's illegal, right? What we are proposing in today's debate is that if you see fit and you pass this very particular policy, then when we write in the policy, it's under the same understanding that from now on ASEAN members are being exempted from the non-intervention policy. If you hold the status of ASEAN member, you welcome intervention when the uh, when, when the body see fits and German. So I think it's really just a non-starter argument from that side of the house. Third point is in German is a practical analysis, right? Now they talk, you know, we talk a lot about bias, and we mentioned the UN can be biased too. We even throw them a uh, POI about pa uh, Palestine, right? Now this is what they respond, right? They say. The, the, the reason why that Palestine situation happens is because they are biased toward Palestine and therefore they are there, they have no interest in ASEAN. And that's exactly the point, if they have no interest in ASEAN, then they won't get there at the very first place, they don't have the incentive to act that fast. But, but now, let's go back to the original example of bias, right, of Thailand and Cambodia. Now, the mission is very, very clear. We go in, we save lives, we stabilize the, uh, the situation, and we get out, right? It's not like Thailand can go in, save people, and on the way out, we still, you know, land along the way. Ladies and gentlemen, Thai people are not earth bender. Uh, we, we want to be, but we are not, right? Now, okay. Assuming that we're there, right? Assuming that we are earth benders, which is really cool, right? It's not gonna happen because, uh, 
uh, member countries will understand that in, at this very decision, they will understand that decision will need to be made so that uh, it will make the idea that Thailand can be biased. We think the check and balance is there, introduced by all my speakers, then the ones tackled by that side, right? But last but not least, on the idea of competency, right? Now, they are arguing that at the end of the day, ASEAN won't get there first. Fine, we already told you we will, but even if that is the case, then it's not usually exclusive. We are proposing a win-win situation. Meaning what? If the situation were to happen, the ASEAN members and the UN will all rush towards uh, that very power and try to kill. If they get there first, that's very good. If not, we get there first. We say that is a win-win situation, not mutually exclusive. Again, we don't think there should be a problem with that. Last but not least, we are really, really sad and disappointed that we came up with a lot of points. We talk about deterrence, we talk about credibility and image, why it's so important. We talk about the AEC progress and why we need to do this. We even talk about positive bias and how, you know, you know, if anything, then the bias is not towards destroying that very nation, but the bias is towards doing anything possible to help make that nation prosper and stabilize again. Now, if they think that that is not important, then at least tell us why. They have never told us why, and they are running out of speaker. It's very sad and joking. It's time that they go back to God hand, ladies and gentlemen. It's time that we take matters into our own hand. We love AEC, we love ASEAN, we love you all. Thank you very much. <laughs> The speaker spoke for 4 minutes and 16 seconds. We thank all the debaters for this round. We now call on both sides to please cross the house. And please, the adjudicators, please leave the room to make the decision. <laughs>